Question 16 from the 2023 Higher Physics Examination Paper 1. Waves from coherent sources S1 and S2 produce an interference pattern and maxima are detected at the position shown. We're told that the path difference S1k to S2k is going to be 154 millimetres and the wavelength of the waves is and we're asked to find that wavelength. Let's ascertain first of all the central maximum that's the central maximum there. And the one we're looking at, K, if you count down, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, that's going to be the fifth maximum. So you always count from after the central maximum, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So at position K, we're really looking at the fifth maximum. What's the condition for the path difference to give you the fifth maximum? Well, the path difference must be equal to five whole wavelengths. And we're told that the actual path difference, S1k minus S2k, is 154 millimetres. So all we have got to do is match the two up. So we've got five whole wavelengths. Should give us 154 millimetres. And we divide by five, both sides, to give us 154 divided by five millimetres. And if we do that in a calculator, we get 30 Point eight millimeters. So the wavelength of that light is in fact going to be 30.8 millimeters, and the answer for that is going to be number or letter E. Question 17 from Paper 1 of the 2023 Higher Physics Examination from the SQA. Which graph shows the relationship between frequency f and wavelength lambda of photons of electromagnetic radiation? Well, we know that all electromagnetic radiation travels at the speed of light, so we can say the speed V is going to equal to C, which is a constant, which is the speed of light. And we know from our past studies in physics that the speed of a wave V is equal to the frequency times the wavelength. Now, we know that V in electromagnetic radiation becomes C, so we can replace the V with C to give us the speed of light C is always equal to the frequency of the radiation times the wavelength of that radiation. Now let's do a bit of manipulation to get frequency on its own. And we can say the following. We can take frequency and lambda over to the left-hand side and just swap the equation about. And then divide both sides by lambda. And we get C upon lambda. So there's our relationship. Frequency is equal to a constant divided by the wavelength. Another way of writing that is saying frequency is inversely proportional to the wavelength. Now, which graph is that going to be? Well, we could start to guess the graph because we could start to say things like, well, if you make lambda very big, the frequency is going to be very small. So we go to this graph here, we make lambda very big. Yeah, indeed, the frequency is coming down to a very small value. So that could be one which we'll be looking at. But so is this one here. If you make the, the wavelength very big, the frequency is going to come down to that point there as well. So it could be that one as well. This one, no. Because if you make the wavelength bigger, the frequency is actually getting bigger. This one here, the same. You make the frequency bigger, the wavelength is getting bigger. And this one here's frequency is directly proportional to lambda. So we've got to rule that one out, but that's not what we've got here. The final one, once again, if you make lambda very big, frequency is going to become very big and level out, so it's not that one there. So we have a choice of two graphs here. We've got this one or that one. And if you're really stuck, you would be stuck to decide which one it's going to be. But we know, and from your previous graph work, that the frequency is directly proportional to one upon the wavelength, means that a quantity inversely proportional to another quantity, you get this graph here. And we'll take you to a simulation of graphs now to recap that in a minute. So the answer to 17 is A, because the frequency is directly proportional to one upon the wavelength. And that graph there is the graph, the relationship graph of frequency being directly proportional to one upon wavelength. Now let's go and see what the simulation is going to show us from Desmos graphs. Now, when you get into the higher physics examination, you must be really sure you know the relationships of certain types of graphs. And I've done the first four ones here for you. We have got y equals 1 upon x, which was the one which we're looking at in the question. And you can see if I plot that graph, it's a famous one going down like that. So that's the one you're looking for, for y equals 1 upon x. The one 
below it, y equals x, or y equals a constant times x, is just really a straight line. And you can see that right away from uh, different relationships. y equals kx, k being a constant. y is proportional to x, you get the straight line. The other common one is y equals x squared, and I'll be showing that one. We get a curve going up the way like that. It's a parabola, y equals x squared. And the other one which can be confused with 1 upon x is this one here, y equals 1 upon x squared. That's the inverse square law. And you can see once again, it's one of these steep curves that go down and fade away into the axis like that. So it pays you to go onto a graph making site like Desmos, and rehearse the graphs and rehearse the relationships before you get into the exam. The answer to this one was y equals uh, 1 upon x, uh, because that was, of course, the frequency is equal to 1 divided by the wavelength, and we get this graph here like that. Question 18 from Paper 1 of the 2023 Higher Physics Examination from the SQA. A ray of monochromatic light travels from a crown glass block into water. The diagram shows three paths, P, Q and R, for the ray of light in the water. Which row in the table shows what happens to the speed in the wavelength and the path of the ray of light as it falls into the water? Now the first thing we have to do is ascertain which of those materials, uh, crown glass and water, has got the more dense optical medium. Because we have to know that to, to find out what happens to the rays of light. And to do that we have to go to our information sheet at the beginning of our exam. And there's a snippet from it there. And we can see from the table that crown glass has got a refractive index of 1.50. And water has got a refractive index of 1.330. So this ray of light is going from a more dense optical medium into a less dense optical medium. So let's sort of kind of like summarise what happens in that case by looking at this diagram here. You can see if we go from a more dense to a less dense optical medium we see there's going to be an increase in the wavelength. And if we go from, look at the speed situation, we go from a more dense optical medium to a less dense one, there's going to be an increase in the speed as well. And also, the ray of light bends away from the normal, which is the exact opposite if you have a ray of light going from a less dense optical medium like air into a more dense optical medium like water. So the answer to this question, we have to be very careful about it. We know that we're going to have an increase in speed and an increase in wavelength, so we could have D or E here. But the clincher is the ray of light is going to not go to R, because R would make it bend towards the normal. That's what happens when you go from a, a less dense, a more dense optical medium. It's not going to be Q, because Q is going straight through, so it must be P. So when you go from a more dense to a less dense optical medium, the ray of light bends away from the normal. So it's going to follow the direction of ray P. So the answer to that question is going to be uh, E, which is going to give us all those proper answers. E, the speed increases, the wavelength increases, and it follows path P. Question 19 from Paper 1 of the 2023 Higher Physics Examination from the SQA. An AC power supply of negligible internal resistance is connected to an 8 ohm resistor. The RMS voltage of the power supply is 5 volts, and we're asked to find the peak power dissipated in an 8 ohm resistor. Well, we know from the power equations from a relationship sheet that power is going to go to V squared divided by R. And we can see the peak power then is going to be equal to the peak voltage all squared divided by R. Now we also know that we've got the peak voltage in terms of the RMS is equal to root 2 times VRMS. So the peak voltage in this case is going to be the square root of 2 times, and it's going to be VRMS, it's going to be 5 volts. So if we put this V peak into the power equation, we have the following, the peak power is going to go to V peak squared, which is going to be the square of root 2 times 5, and we'll have to square that, divided by, and the resistance is going to be 8 ohms. So that's going to give us, the bracket here is the square root of 2 times, well, square root of 2 squared is going to give us 2, and the square root of 5 
A square of 5 is going to give us 25. It's going to be 2 times 25 divided by 8. And therefore that gives us the peak power, which we'll just work out there now, is going to be equal to 2 times 25 over 8 is 50 divided by 8. And we get 6.3. And the units for power is the watts. So our answer is going to be 6.3 watts, which is going to be uh, response E. Question 20 from paper 1 of the 2023 Higher Physics Examination from the SQA. Six 36 ohm resistors are connected as shown. The total resistance between the points X and Y is, and we're asked to find that out. Now, when you see a resistance combination like that, you think of the quick ways to do it. I wouldn't advise you to do 1 upon RT equals 1 upon R1 plus 1 upon R2, because there must be a simpler way to attack this one. It's a multiple choice question after all. Now, we look at, we've got the, the second year, we've got three branches, 1, 2 and 3. The middle branch is made up of a parallel resistor of 36 and 36 ohms. And the other two is made up of a serious branch of 36 and 36. So that top branch, if we just add them together, becomes 72. Hmm, represent it like that. The middle two branches between X and Y are in parallel 36 ohms. So we can draw them in like that. And that last branch here, 36 and 36, we can call out the 72 ohm resistor again like that. Now, here comes the crunch for this problem to do it quickly. You can see that we've got 72 ohms and 72 ohms down here. They're in parallel. And if you've got two resistors with the same value in parallel, then the sum of the resistors is just half of that. So I can take that 72 ohm resistor and it's in parallel with the other 72 ohm resistor and just simply replace that with a 36 ohm resistor. So take them away and replace it with a 36 ohm resistor. And now look what I've got. I've got three parallel resistors, all with the same value, 36 ohms, and to find the combined resistance between the three of those, I just divide by how many resistors are there. I can do that because the value of the resistors are all the same. So the total resistance between those two points reduced to this value here, 36 in parallel with 36 in parallel with 36, it's going to be just simply 36 ohms divided by 3, which is going to give us a total of 12 ohms. So a very good problem if you know where to quickly go and get resistors reduced to another resistor. So the total resistance is 12 ohms, and that's going to give us an answer of C for number 20.